Uh, as you can see, we got a new speaker up here today. Uh, two things I will say before I'm unlike Greg is that number one, I probably won't yell. And number two, I just forgot what number two was. Oh yeah, I'll probably stick pretty close to here. <laughs> because this is my first time ever doing this, so I'm a little nervous. So uh, Greg has told us many times that we are to share the good news with, as it's been said, especially today, a dead and dying people. In Matthew 28, Jesus himself said to the apostles before he ascended into heaven, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So how do we do, as Jesus said, make disciples of all nations? Well, before I share that with you, the how, I want to share with you the why. I'm sure you realize the world's crazy and getting crazier every day. So why is that? I'll explain in a moment. First, let me say that I, and many more, maybe you also, believe that we are in the last minutes of human history and are at the beginning of the birth pains that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24. Now, bear in mind that minutes may be years because Peter told us that to not, not to overlook look this one fact that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. For a little fun with math, a thousand years is one day means that in God's time there are roughly 41.7 years per hour and 8.3 months per minute. For a little more fun, at the beginning of 2017, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists announced in its annual report that a doomsday clock is two and a half minutes until midnight. Therefore, using Peter's logic, could it be that we're less than two years away from Armageddon? But I digress. Let's go back to why the world is crazier and getting crazier all the time and the birth pains of Jesus' pensions. To expound on what I said earlier, in Matthew 24, Jesus said that in the end times, there will be, there'll be many signs that will be the beginning of the birth pains. In the interest of time, I will not mention the signs, but as a Berean, you can easily look them up. So birth or labor pains can be briefly, briefly described as such. Although it's not unusual to experience periodic irregular contractions as labor nears, contractions that occur at intervals of less than 10 minutes usually indicate that labor has begun. The beginning of labor is described in three phases. The latent phase is the longest and less than, least intense. During this phase, contractions become more frequent. In the active phase, the intense, intense pain or pressure may be felt during each contraction. During transition, the birthing process is ready to begin and contractions are very strong, painful, and frequent. Doesn't it appear to you that the craziness of the world, say in the last 20 or 30 years, started out slowly, with the events not being that intense, have become more frequent, and recently become very strong, painful, and more frequent? Hence the birth pains. Some time ago, we watched the movie The Coming Convergence. In that movie, we were shown the converging signs that point to the soon rapture of the church, Jesus' return, and Daniel's 70th week, that many call the tribulation. And I believe that what I'm about to share confirms that. And that leads us into the why we need to make disciples of all nations. It's imperative that we get, get right, or are right, with the Lord, share the good news through our testimony, and look up because our redemption draws near. We are seeing a rapid and intensified convergence of signs that point to the nearness of Daniel's 70th week. And if Daniel's 70th week is near, if you believe as I do, that means the rapture of the church is that much nearer. So what are the major signs of this increasingly rapid and intensifying convergence? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I will say in the interest of time, I'll supply a 50,000 uh, foot view, so to speak, on some while offering details on others. I might also add that I stopped reviewing news stories. This is really interesting. I stopped reviewing news stories as of this last Tuesday because there's just so much out there, it's, it just becomes overwhelming and it's, it's, you just can't keep up with it. So the convergence of the signs. The first sign is the Jewish people. On November 29, 1947, 
The United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for Palestine to be partitioned between Arabs and Jews, allowing for the formation of the Jewish State of Israel. On May 15, 1948, in Tel Aviv, Jewish Agency Chairman David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the State of Israel establishing the first Jewish state in 2,000 years. That's a really big sign. Uh, I, I, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the lesson of the fig tree. In Matthew 24, 32 through 34, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts its, out its leaves, you know that summer is near at the very gates. And like I said, 1948 marked the establishment of the first Jewish state in 2000, 2000 years, and the state of Israel is known as the fig tree nation. Let me get a drink of water here. Another sign of the Jewish people is the Jews returning to Israel. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of Bible passages predict the return of Israel to the land of Palestine. Here are only two. Ezekiel 20, 34, I'll bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you've been scattered, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. Isaiah 11, 11 through 12, In that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Another sign for the Jewish people is all the Jews returning from around the world are returning back home to Israel. The law of return is an Israeli law which gives Jews the right to come and live in Israel and gain Israeli citizenship. The al al aliyah, aliyah numbers, with Aliyah meaning immigration of Jews from outside ancient Israel, have increased rapidly over the past few years and due to wars and increasing anti-Semitic aggression around the world. Jews have immigrated from Ukraine, France, England, Belarus, Russia, the Baltic countries of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, Uzbekistan, India, China, and others. So the Jews are back in their land after 2,000 years, and even more returning annually. The next sign is modern technology. In Daniel 12.4, Daniel says, but you, Daniel, or I should say in Daniel 12.4 it says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many run, shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. One of the first signs of modern technology is artificial intelligence. These are just some headlines I've, I've come across within the last few weeks. How do you make a conscious robot? Here's a real big one. Sophia the robot granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia. A robot being granted citizenship. Superhuman brain implanted chips to be ready within 15 years. I'll more about that in a little bit. And then Russia's new robot tank will outperform humans. Another thing that came up recently was Bill Gates' plan to build 25,000 acre smart city in Arizona. Smart cities, if you think of Google Home, if I'm sure you've seen the commercials on TV, are, are a key component of the full implementation of the New World Order, which I'll talk about more in a minute, because they are a comprehensive expression of scientific social engineering. Technologies pioneered by Gates will quickly weave their way into other existing cities. Another sign is worldwide upheaval. Wars and threats of wars. That's it said right there in Mark, uh, Matthew 24, Jesus says that himself. Uh, first one is U.S. North Korea. I'm sure everybody's reading about that in the headlines. Well, on November 11, 2017, three U.S. Navy aircraft carriers joined South Korea forces to begin joint naval exercises in the waters of the North of Korean Peninsula, Peninsula in a show of force against North Korea. U.S. Iran, that's another big one in the news. October 13, 2017, President Trump refused to certify that Iran is keeping the nuclear treaty that it signed. He also laid out a case for declaring war on Iran and giving Congress 60 days to decide what to do. Congress can change things by taking action against Iran, imposing sanctions, etc. But if Congress doesn't act as Commander-in-Chief, Trump can do what he thinks needs to be done. This is extremely significant in light of the fact that Israel and the Arabs want the U.S. to halt Iran's nuclear weapons program, 
Israel wants the Arabs to recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish nation. The Arabs want Israel to help the U.S. halt Iran's nuclear weapons program. And Trump wants Israel and the Arabs to sign a peace treaty. I'm sorry. And Trump wants Israel and the Arabs to sign a peace treaty. Bring, that bring, brings that to mind. And on, in Daniel 9.27 it says, He shall make a strong covenant with many for a week. Another one is Saudi Arabia and Iran. I don't know if you saw this headline. On November 6th, Saudi Arabia calls a missile launch on Riyadh an act of war by Iran, vows retaliation. Israel and Iran, on April 5th, 2017, the headline read, this is the reason Israel will attack soon. Israel knows what the rest of the Western world is afraid to admit. Iran is not the first nation that wanted to wipe out the Jews and take over the world, otherwise known as Sharia law. If Israel doesn't defend herself and the world, who will? Iran establishes a military base just 35 miles from Israel, in Syria, from the, Isra from the Israeli border. According to the BBC, citing Western intelligence source, Iran has established a permanent military base outside of El Kishwa, eight miles south of Damascus, and some 35 miles north of Israel's border in Syria. And of course, you all read about the worldwide terrorist attacks all the time, U.S., Paris, London, etc. Did you know that there have been 1,039 attacks and almost 7,000 fatalities up until November 10th of this year. Just that. And then, I don't know if you've heard about the bubonic plague coming back. That's a disease that killed 25 million people in Europe alone in the Middle Ages. And this, the headline just recently was on, in the news. But behold, a black horse. Airborne black death, death epidemic could explode. The rise of falsehood is the next sign. Well, the biggest sign, one of the biggest signs of falsehood right now is the global warming agenda. According to NASA's own data, remote, I'm sorry, according to NASA's own data, the world is more a mere 0 0.36 degrees Fahrenheit since they started measuring the data in 1979. Hardly anything to panic about, however, however this does mean the world is warmer, right? Well, the problem with that argument is that we experienced the bulk of that warming between 1979 and 1998. Since then, we've actually been ha having temperatures drop. We haven't seen any global warming in 19 years. We can see the global warming argument as data showing that the North Polar ice cap is increasing in size. Recent satellite images from NASA actually reflect increased 43% to 63%. This is quite opposite of what the global warming faction warned us. In 2007, while accepting a Nobel Prize for his global warming initiative, Al Gore made a striking prediction. The North Polar ice cap is falling off a cliff. This is in 2007, remember. It could be completely gone in summer in as little as seven years. That means in 2014, the polar ice cap could be supposed to be gone. Sounds like a lie to me. Al Gore couldn't be more wrong. However, despite this clear evidence that temperatures are not increasing, the global warming hysteria only seems to be increasing. For example, President Obama himself tweeted on May 16, 2014, 97% of scientists agree climate change is real, man-made and dangerous. John Kerry, Al Gore, and a host of others have also championed this statistic. Since then, it has become clear that this statistic is inaccurate. The Wall Street Journal went as far as to say the assertion that 97% of scientists believe that climate change is a man-made urgent problem is a fiction. Conversely, we come to find out that the study Obama cited was botched from the start with this Forbes headline, Global Warming Alarmist Caught Doctoring 97% Consensus Claims. A host of other problems for the global warming crowd are emerging, such as lock leaked emails from global warming scientists that state the Earth is not warming Evidenced by this one, it states, the fact is that we can't account for the lack of global warming at the moment, and it's a travesty we can't. Proof is emerging that Al Gore and even President Obama have financially benefited from fueling the global warming hysteria. It's becoming harder and harder for the global warming community to ignore some of the scientific data that shows the Earth is not getting warmer, instead it's getting cooler. What makes one wonder 
Why are we spending $22 billion a year on global warming initiatives, and where is the money going? Fake news, I know you hear that about, about that all the time. I don't know if you ever heard this, but this, this, this made headlines probably about, obviously about six months ago. It, it, it was a real big thing, and also you heard nothing of it ever since then. And this, just hear what this says. Project Veritas catches CNN producer on tape admitting that Trump-Russia narrative is fake. And yet they continue saying this, that, that, that it's, it's happened, it's, it's true. And yet, like I said, this narrative continues to, even to this day. They got that Mueller guy doing his thing. Here was another thing I read. Truth, for, truth versus fiction. 2017 has become a watershed year when subjective reasoning and people's feelings finally trump reality. We are here to point out now where the government is actually mandating many of these things. For example, men can identify as women. Women can identify as men. Men and women can identify as either or neither. Physically healthy people can identify as disabled. Adults can identify as toddlers or babies or animals. Babies are no longer human. Human overpopulation is the world's second greatest problem. The world's first great problem, whether anyone admits it or not, is Israel exists again. Borders and walls are bad. Unchecked immigration is good. Islam equals peace. Christianity equals hate. The American Constitution no longer matters. Socialism is in. Capitalism is now fascism. The sad thing is that if you disagree with any of these things I just mentioned, you are labeled a hater, a homophobe, Islamophobe, racist, bigot, fascist, etc. While this is troubling, stranger things are than that or even on the horizon. The rise of wickedness is another sign. The FDA recently approved the first digital pill for behavior modification. Health healthcare enters a new phase of treatment. I'm sorry, healthcare enters a new phase as treatment is delivered by enforceable drug regimens. Physicians will be mandated to use digital drugs or face censure or dismissal. Physicians are already subject to evidence-based medicine where treatments are mandated from above with penalties for non-compliance. LBG, L, LGB, LGBT, transgenderism, kids as young as four are referred to reassignment experts as 50 kids a week visit their general practitioners about gender. A shocked Georgia mom launches a complaint against her daughter's school after her sixth grade class was given a quiz that asked them to identify their sexual identity. The rise of Satanism, I don't know if you saw this or not. An after school Satan club may be coming to your kid's elementary school. I've actually seen this in, uh, advertised. Planned Parenthood encourages black women in America to choose abortion over pregnancy. These are, these are actual headlines. Federal court moles making prostitution legal in California. HIV positive people who knowingly expose others won't be charged with a felony in California. Gay shop owner kicks Christmas out of his, Christians out of his business because his belief, their beliefs offend him. The rise of apostasy is next. Some, some uh, recent headlines. Chaos in the church. Non-binary deacons, drag shows, and trans transgender baptisms. Christian pastors say practicing homosexuality, gay marriage, transgenderism, etc. is okay. Feel good itching ears religion with the likes of Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, Brian McLaren, Carl Lentz, Rob Bell, and others. I don't, I, I'm sorry if I offend anybody by that, but that's, that's the truth. Next is the one world religion. The rise of a universalism. Does anybody know what universalism means? It's all paths lead to God. The rise of ecumenism. Joining Catholicism, Protestants, Protestants, Protestants <laughs> <laughs> and Islam. And then Kenneth Copeland just recently declared the end of the Reformation, and he calls, he calls for the end of it. On October 24, 2017, listen to this. Kenneth Copeland held an ecumenical meeting in Kansas City, Missouri, with Pro Pope Francis watching by video. Listen to this. Copeland claimed to be God's anointed prophet and claimed to have the power of God to bring fire from heaven to burn the stubble. 
presenting a veiled threat to all churches who do not get in step with the ecumenical movement. Copeland leads the way for anti-Protestant Reformation propaganda that born-again believers should reunite with the apostate Roman Catholic Church under Pope Francis. They are staging counterfeit new, new apostolic reformation in an attempt to destroy the true church. Next is the one world government. I'm sure you've heard of the new world order of globalism. The global, globalist magazine, The Economist, reported that President Trump is a danger to the new world order. The magazine is right. Trump's desire to make, make America great again goes against the globalist desire to surrender the sovereignty of the U.S. to the U.N. I don't mind telling you that I'm wondering if God is using President Trump and the Christians in his administration to restrain the rise of the Antichrist. Former, George, former President George W. Bush has just claimed to be a globalist. By, listen to this. He would rarely criticize President Obama for anything such as his views on abortion and gay marriage, his illegal executive orders, his IRS illegally targeting political enemies, his constantly blaming every failure on President Bush. He went public to take a swipe at President Trump by saying, we cannot wish globalism away. This is why Trump is being attacked so much as he is, because all the globalists are wanting to, don't, don't want him in there. He is right. God has said it is coming, and it will happen. Here's another one. Pope Francis called for, calls for one world government to save humanity. In June, Pope Francis called for a one world government and political authority argued that the creation of the one world government is needed to combat, combat major issues such as climate change. The Pope said the UN doesn't have enough power and must be granted full governmental control for the good of humanity. But what raised eyebrows was the Pope's call for a new global political authority, one tasked with tackling the reduction of pollution and development of poor countries and regions. His appeal echoed that of his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, who in 2009 encyclical proposed a kind of super UN to deal with the world's economic problems and injustices. Pope Francis also called for changes to the lifestyles and energy consumption to avert the unprecedented destruction of the ecosystem before the end of the century. What happened to preaching the, our president, or not president, I mean po po the Pope, Preaching the gospel and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. He never does that, if you ever, if you ever notice that. It's always pr talking about social issues and things like that. The pontiff has also warned the failure to act would have grave consequences for all of us. The world globalization means exactly what it says. It is the process of transitioning the world into a global government. Religious leaders are playing their part in this great deception. As demonstrated by Pope Francis, climate change and the global warming hoax is now the global least preferred method of scaremongering, and they attempt to shepherd humanity closer to unified totalitarian rule. Disturbingly, world religious, world religious leaders are also beginning to come, to come together as one to preach from the same hymn sheet, instructing their sheep to, to accept the components of the New World Order's One World Government. As I stated earlier, world leaders from a diverse collection of religious communities have called for world unity. The call for world government, led by Pope Francis, Ayatollah El Milani, and the Dalai Lama, and Rabbi Abraham Skorka, is seen as a major step on the road to the New World Order that was prophesied over 2,000 years ago. The world religious leaders came together on June 14th to make a joint, fit, joint statement through video calling on people to embrace, embrace ideas of friendship and unity and to overcome negativity and division of society. In reality, the call for global government by Pope Francis and wealthy elitists has nothing to do with lifting up impoverished nations or saving humanity. Such a government would instead guarantee global surveillance, global wealth inequality, and a world run by ex exact corrupt interests currently consolidating wealth and power worldwide. Only got two more. <laughs> One world economy. This is a real big one with me. I don't know if you ever heard about the cashless society. We're headed towards a cashless society even as we speak. 
In Revelation 13, 16 through 17, it says, He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. A cashless society will require a type of ID that cannot be hacked or stolen. What better way to prevent both than to require a mark or a chip in the human, in the human body? We're already being groomed to accept it. More about that in a minute. There may be no more perfect picture of a cashless society than what we are seeing in Asia. In China, cash is gravely wounded and on its deathbed. And if you don't have a mobile payment account, you're going to have a difficult time accomplishing even the most basic tasks. Mobile payment volume in China doubled to $5 trillion last year. Cash society, this is a headline I saw this recently. Cashless society barrels forward. Governments begin testing cryptocurrencies as cash use plummets. It's time for the world's central banks and regulators to get serious about digital currencies, according to the head of the Inter International Monetary Fund. And this is what I saw last summer. Visa CEO Al Kelly said, we're focused on putting cash out of business. He, he said that and he announced that Visa would grant up to $10,000 to 50 small merchants if they stopped accepting cash completely. Instead, accepting only debit cards, credit cards, and mobile payments. Some restaurants have already phased out cash as a form of payment. The Mark of the Beast. This is a recent headline, which is a, I feel is a, le a leading into the mark of the beast, the most comprehensive universal ID card in the world. Another one, Trump administration is seeking the alternatives to social security numbers. Will you soon make payments with your face? Microchips, let's talk about microchips. I'm sure you've seen them in the, in the little cleaning I'm right there. In Wisconsin, a Wisconsin company, Three Square Market, became the first in the U.S. to offer microchip implants to its employees. Yes, you heard that right. Microchip implants. Swedish commuters freak people out as they use microchip implants to purchase daily train tickets. The chief executive, this was just recently, the chief executive of the World Olympians Association called for the chipping of Olympic athletes. He is in favor of allowing athletes to refuse to be chipped but he wants athletes to refuse to be barred from competition. On the other hand, the Antichrist and the false prophet won't allow people to refuse the mark. Remember what I said about the mark before about the mark being required? Well, guess what? Revelation 24. Those who refuse will be beheaded. Revelation 24 says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Jesus for Christ for the 4,000 years. Well, that's just the converging signs. I got more. <laughs> just as interesting is a blog that I read just last week by Jan Markell, I never thought I would see the day. It's, she says that as 2017 winds down, she has come up with a list of highlights, I'll call them, of the aberration in the culture and in this church that she and I just didn't think we'd live to see. She went on to say that things aren't falling apart, they're falling in place. Listen, I don't think, oh, she, she, I'm sorry, listen, I didn't think I would live to see the earth really in an apocalyptic manner, yet most going on about business as usual eating, drinking, and enjoying life. Every natural disaster preceded by such words is unprecedented, history bacon, or of biblical proportion. A hurricane, Irma, so strong that it was measured on a device that tracks earthquakes. A major U.S. newspaper saying that someday everyone will willingly get microchipped. Planned Parenthood teaming up with Satanists and cooperating in their mutual evil. Some people heed the warning of signs of impending natural disasters, but scoff at the ultimate warnings that Jesus returning, is returning soon and you must be ready. Lost my place, 
America seriously talks about the possibility of an EMP attack and Hawaii being warned of a nuclear attack by North Korea. Over 40% of Americans prefer socialism over capitalism. Actors in Central Park simulate the assassination of a U.S. president. Satanic outfits being granted IRS tax-exempt status while Christians and conservatives are overlooked and ignored. A leader of the Catholic Church in South America is stating that Pope Francis is paving the way for the Antichrist. A major newspaper calling Satan good and calling him a great representation of secularism. A discussion of womb transplants, and, womb transplants in men. Preschoolers being lectured by a de demonic porn creature that transgenderism is normal. The Boy Scouts allowing girls to join their organization. Word of a revival in the Middle East countries such as Iran. World revival in North Korea. The son of a Hamas leader who is now a Christian telling the UN that Palestinian leaders are a bunch of terrorists. Rick Warren saying he hoped his partnership with the Catholic leader will become the ecumenical model for the entire world. K through 12 U.S. educators demonizing Israel and lauding Islam. A Democrat leader, Donna Brazile, blowing the whistle on a Democrat party corruption. The re I mentioned this earlier, the return of the bubonic plague. A prominent secular host said we live in interesting times. Too interesting. He longs to go back to the 1950s. He doesn't understand the last days would be characterized by departure from the normal and acceleration of the aberrant. He can't grasp the fact that the Bible predicted a lot of what our headlines are today. Wow. And almost all this news is from the last few months. As Jan said, things aren't falling apart, they're falling into place. Wait! <laughs> I'm not over yet. <laughs> almost. To start, I believe that Hillary, if Hillary Clinton had been elected president in 2016, that this convergence would be charging along at greater than breakneck speed. And even though it's been extremely fast since President Trump took office, it's not, it hasn't been as fast as the globalists want. Look at all the opposition that President Trump has gone through last year. But even so, as I stated earlier, I believe God appointed Donald Trump to win a 2016 presidential election for a reason. Let's look at some scripture. Daniel 4.17 The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives to whom he will. Romans 13.1 Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now I don't pretend to know why exactly why Donald Trump won, but my guess is it has to do with the setting of the prophetic stage. According to scripture, when the Antichrist, the man of sin, son of perdition, the rider of the white horse, etc., arrives in the scene, he does so at an unprecedented time of crisis and upheaval. A world clamoring for peace and security doesn't do so if it already has peace and security in place. The man of sin disguises his political ambitions under the false banner of peace. Daniel 7, 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among came up. Try to over. I can't even remember what it occurred first. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel 8, 24. His power shall be great, but not, but not by his power, and he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. But in order for there to be a global demand for peace, there first needs to be a global crisis, instability, and war. Think about it this way. Why do we even know the names of men like Muhammad Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, they were great peacemakers who rose up in a period of great injustice. If there hadn't been an injustice to begin with, they wouldn't have felt the compulsion to do something about it. But because there was a great injustice, they did rise up and their messages were heard, 
and it did resonate with the masses, thus propelling them into historic greatness. This is why I believe Trump, President Trump is prophetically significant. He is a leader who has watched the world moving in the wrong direction for a long time and feels compelled to do something about it. For decades, previous American leaders have allowed the crises we see today to fester and go unchecked. In turn, it has created a world where the options for peaceful, peaceful resolutions have become all but non-existent. This is very much the same way that the pre-World War II European leaders refused to deal with Adolf Hitler until they were forced to deal with him. The only option left to us now in regards to both Iran and North Korea is war, and war brings instability to the world order. Decades of failed attempts both prove both that our economic embargoes and diplomacy has repeatedly and gloriously failed. But out, out of war and instability will come a world, will come a world who demands peace and security above all else. Let us not forget that in the aftermath of World War I or World War II, serious and concerted efforts to create globalist organizations, the League of Nations and the United Nations, that would unite the global order into one, one were created. After the next World War, will be, uh, after the next World War will be when the man of Antichrist, the man Antichrist rises up. Interesting thing here from this a lot, many years ago, with Henry Spock, uh, the Secretary General of NATO from uh, roughly 1957 1960, said, What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the alliances of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Listen to this Send us such a man, and he be God or the devil, and we will receive him. The geopolitical situation will allow the opportunity for a man such as this to rise from the political stage. The man comes on a white horse, a false peace, and will take advantage of the advancements in technology that I've spoken of, along with the supernatural backing of a satanic benefactor to impose his iron-fisted will over the entire world. He will capitalize on the moral and spiritual bankruptcy of the world that has been left behind, and what I mean by left behind, the people left behind after the rapture, to deceive them. These are, these are they who do not receive the love of the truth. The stage has been set. The actors are in place. We are about to witness now is the curtain rise and the prologue to begin. While the church promised by Christ himself to not enter into the 70th week, what we are witnessing now is the first act of things to come before we are supernaturally caught up and will be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also, may be also. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my word about patience and endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world, to those who dwell on the earth. So, after all that, I can finally answer the how we can, as Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, as we go through today's teaching, we humbly ask your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and make us bold in how we can share our testimony with the unsaved, so as to help them bring the bring them the saving grace, mercy, and knowledge of Jesus Christ as revealed by your Holy Spirit. Please help us to be receptive to your still small voice so we can hear and apply what we learned today. We ask this in the most precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Please turn your Bibles to Acts 22. As you turn there, as an introduction, I can speak from personal experience that, have been that can be difficult to share the good news, and probably like me, we usually are at a loss for words when given the chance. Before we even start, I know, here we go again, huh? I need to, we need to ask ourselves, what is the good news? Everything in life has good news and bad news associated with it. The entire landscape of biblical truth is generally found in the combination of both. Emphasizing one side to the exclusion of the other is not the whole truth. 
This is the same, this is true, the same is true with the gospel of Jesus Christ. First, the bad news. I'm, I mean, I'm, just, I'm sure you all know this, but I just want to, want to bring it up. First, the bad news. Spiritually speaking, is what we are is that we are all sinners deserving of hell for us, our sin against the holy God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The result is what Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, meaning that our sin has kept us from God's presence and eternal life. And as Romans 3.10 says, No one can earn his or her way into the presence of God because there is no one righteous, and that our best human efforts to please God are, as Isaiah 64 says, as filthy rags. That's the bad news. What's the good news? Here's a verse that many of you are familiar with, but now I'll add a little context. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son to into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed the name of the Son of God, the only Son of God. So it can be said that God wants a relationship with this human creation and has communicated with us in a variety of ways. First, there's nature. Romans 1.20 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. The Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And also Jesus coming to us in human form to live among us. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory, uh, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the good news is that God loves us and that Jesus Christ is God's provision for the bad news of our sinful condition. Let's turn to Romans 10, 9 through 13 for the how. This by far is probably my most favorite verse in the whole Bible. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses it and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So there is no way that until someone knows and understands the bad news, that they can truly appreciate the good news. You wouldn't appreciate a stranger bursting into your home and dragging you outside unless you first understood that your house was on fire. If we can't make someone understand they are destined for hell because of their sin, they cannot truly appreciate what God, what Jesus did for them on the cross. If we can't make someone realize how hopeless they are, they won't recognize the great hope Jesus offers. Unless they recognize that they are sinners, they can't appreciate a Savior. So how can we convey the good news by also talking about the bad news? The best approach for presenting the good news is to present what the Apostle Paul called the whole counsel of God, as described in Acts 20:27. 20, God's whole counsel includes both the bad news about our natural state and the good news about plan, God's plan to redeem us. So now indulge me, if you will, while I set the stage so we can understand how Paul intertwined the bad news, good news approach in sharing his testimony in his attempt to make disciples of all nations, both Jew and Gentile. In Acts 21, upon the Apostle Paul, Paul's arrival in Jerusalem, he is greeted with all kinds of problems and troubles, for the Jews who really hated him. No sooner had he entered the temple when the entire city was in an uproar. A riot starts because of the rumor, a rumor that has spread about him. It's at this point that Paul is taken into a protective custody, and on his way to the Antonio Fortress, he asks to speak to the crowd. For who's Paul, who's now on the steps of the fortress, speaks to what is virtually the entire city of Jerusalem. Surely he will speak the gospel, the good news. Well, yes and no. Paul will preach the good news, but the way he does it is by actually packaging it in the sharing of his testimony. 
Paul is going to rise from the scriptures and teach us how it's done. So let's read the text. Acts 21, or I'm sorry, 22. Brothers, this is from ESV, so it might be a little bit different than yours. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born of Tarsus and Solcia, but brought up in this city, educated the feet of Gamali, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as of all you are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there to, and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who live there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will not be a witness unto him, every one of whom you have seen and heard. And now why, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I, return, have return, when I have returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get to out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed them. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he shall not be allowed to live. So, based on all this, how do we share our testimony and make disciples of all, all nations? Well, in verse 1, it says, Brothers and his fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. So the first one is be prepared. Paul starts by telling them to listen to his defense. The Greek word for defense is apologia, where we get our word apologetics. <coughs> this doesn't mean Paul was apologizing or doesn't mean he was defending himself. Rather, he was presenting a defense of the gospel. In other words, he's defending the faith by giving a reason and rationale for why he believed what he believed in Jesus as the Messiah. It's interesting that he begins his defense of the gospel the same way that Stephen did in Acts chapter 7. One has to wonder if Paul hasn't been prepared in anticipation of his grand opportunity to address an audience of this, sign, of this size. I'm sorry. I believe Paul already had his defense in his hip pocket, so to speak. He was ready because he knew that what awaited him in Jerusalem. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts, honor God, Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do with gentleness and respect. It's been said that it's better to look ahead and prepare than to look, ahead and regret, look back and regret. Paul was ready, and he looked ahead and prepared. Some might argue that when it comes to sharing their testimony, they, must go with, they just go with the flow and trust God will give them the words. I believe that is true, however, we need to be prepared for what God may have prepared for us, namely an opportunity to share. As Proverbs 21, Proverbs 21 31 says, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, 
they became even more quiet. So what you got to do is you got to speak their language is the next thing. Paul spoke to them in Aramaic, which is the Hebrew tongue, and the crowd started from started from uh, start having a riot to becoming very quiet. Paul could have spoke Greek, and doubtless that would have been very impressive, but he wouldn't have spoken the language of their heart. I believe it is for this reason that this rioting crowd became very quiet and listened. The apostle was speaking in a way that they understood. Whenever Paul spoke, he either made people glad, sad, or mad, but at least they knew and understood what he was saying to them. When sharing our testimony, I think we, I think we do err when we use certain Christian words. People simply don't understand what we're saying. Let me tell you a story to illustrate this point. A man bought a donkey from a preacher. The preacher told the man that this donkey had been trained in every, a very unique way, being the donkey of a preacher. The only way to make a donkey go was to say, Hallelujah. The only way to make a donkey stop was to say, Amen. The man was pleased with his purchase and he immediately got on the, am got on the animal to try out the preacher's instructions. Hallelujah, shouted the man. The donkey began to trot. Amen, shouted the man. The donkey stopped immediately. This is great, said the man. With hallelujah, he rode off very proud of his new purchase. The man traveled for a long time through some mountains. Soon he was heading toward a cliff. He could not remember the words to make the donkey stop. Stop, said the man. Halt, he cried. The donkey just kept on going. Oh, no. Bible. Church. Please stop, shouted the man. The donkey just began to trot faster. He was getting closer and closer to the cliff edge. Finally, in desperation, the man said a prayer. Please, dear Lord, please make this donkey stop before I go off the head of this mountain. In Jesus' name, amen. The donkey came to an abrupt stop. Amazing. <laughs> Just one step from the edge of the cliff. Hallelujah, shot the man. <laughs> the moral of the story, be careful and prayer, be prayerful with the words you choose to use so you can be understood. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, Cilicia, but brought up in this city. So what we need to do next is find common ground with people when we're sharing our testimony. Paul purposely informs them that he is a Jew and that he was born in Tarsus of Cilicia and that he was brought up in Jerusalem. Paul being born in Tarsus made him a Hellenist Jew and for him being brought up in Jerusalem gave him a Hebrew background. In other words, Paul could have said, could have had something in common with and could relate to the Greek, the Hellenist Jews, and the Hebrews as well. He does this because he wants them to know that he is one of them. Paul is establishing a common ground for which to work with, to work with. Paul knows his next his most powerful defense in his testimony. They can argue with his theology and his typology, but not with his testimony. Educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the stricter manner of the law and our fathers, of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are to this day. Excuse me, to this day. I have persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as the high priest, the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who were, who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem and be punished. So the next thing we need to do is earn their respect. Paul tells us how he was trained by Gamil, one of the first, most respected rabbis in Hebrew history, and he, has, he, he was as zealous as they are. In fact, he was so zealous that he used to persecute in prison and even kill those who were followers of the way as Christians. He says that the high priest and council could testify how he took letters to Damascus to bring Christians to Jerusalem and stand trial. For Paul to tell him this was absolutely brilliant. By doing this, he's disarming their hostilities and earning their respect at the same time. He allies himself to both of the Jewish factions in the crowd and by cleverly associating himself with Gamaliel, who was a disciple of Hillel. In so doing, he's earning their respect as a man of school in the law, the rabbinic interpretation of the law, and a zeal for the law. As I was on my way and drew near, drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone on me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, 
Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the man who was speaking to me. So the next thing we need to do is turn on the light. What I just read you uh, from uh, verses 6 through 9 is also further described in Acts, 1, I'm sorry, Acts 9, 1 through 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and, murders, and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Arise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Nor drank. Paul tells him at noon, the brightest part of the day, a bright light from heaven flashed around him. He had seen the light. After seeing the light, after seeing his bright heavenly light, he then falls to the ground and hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul says, Who are you, Lord? Then he hears, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. But his companions didn't understand. Why is Paul telling, telling him all this in this way? I believe it because he wanted them to turn on the light instead of cursing the darkness. He could have easily gone from talking about how zealous he was for the law to pointing out how wrong they were to trust only the law. He chooses to tell them what Jesus, the light of the world, could do in them instead of what the law by itself could, do, could not do for them. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told that what is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. So the next uh, thing to share our testimony, make sure you keep it simple. Paul asked the Lord, what shall I do? Jesus answers him by telling him to simply go to Damascus where he would be told what to do. His companions had to lead him by the hand to Damascus because he was blinded by the brightness and brilliance of the light. I sort of imagine him being held by his hand like a child walking to Damascus with a simple and humble childlike faith in the Lord. What's so interesting about this is that when he's asked, what shall I do, Lord? Jesus doesn't give him a complicated to-do list. Paul just keeps on keeping his testimony very simple by not complicating with a bunch of to-do and telling him how childlike simple it really is. The next thing we need to do is include the miraculous. And one, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. Paul tells them about Ananias, who was a devout observer of the law, and was also highly respected by all the Jews in the area. He tells of how he received his sight when Ananias, who was standing beside him, said to him, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Paul beautifully includes this, includes in this his sharing of his testimony, how this was in fact made a miracle of the supernatural, not just an act in the natural. One commentator says it this way, the last thing Saul had seen was the face of the Christ. The next thing he saw was the face of a Christian. He had seen the head, now he saw a member of the body. Suffice it to say that when we go from death to life, a new birth, in the new birth, and go from spiritual blindness to seeing the light, that's called a miracle. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Shades of uh, Romans 10. So the next thing we need to do is highlight God's forgiveness till we uh, 
to, to provide our testimony to. Paul then says, God, the God of their fathers has chosen him to know God, which will, which is, I'm sorry. Paul then says, the God of our fathers has chosen him to know God's will, which is to see the righteous one and hear his words. He tells them he is to be a witness to all men, referring to both Jews and the Gentiles of what he has heard, seen and heard. Paul tells Ananias then, how Ananias then asked what he's waiting for, and how he should get up, be baptized, and have his sins washed away by calling on the Lord. It's important to know that the forgiveness for what for the what? It's important to know that the forgiveness for and washing away of sin does not come from water baptism, but from calling on Jesus' name. When baptism is preceded by repentance and is attended by a believing, calling on the name of the Lord. It becomes a beautiful emblem of what that washing away of sins, which is graciously given to all believers. Paul told his own conversion, for he well knew what God often, that God often blesses such personal confessions. Charles Spurgeon said that. Paul's emphasis here is not about water baptism, as much as it's about calling on Jesus' name to be forgiven and cleansed from sin. If the Apostle Paul had chosen not to not communicate and highlight this, he would have, in effect, gutted out the good news of the gospel. So, too, is this true for us. If the good news of God's forgiveness is gutted out of our lives, then sin will have dominion over our lives. If I've been the recipient of God's forgiveness and cleansing it for my sin, then sin no longer has permission to control or dominate me. This is the good news, and that's why Paul includes it and even highlights it when he tells them that he was forgiven for all his past sins. Paul not only tells them that he's forgiven and cleansed for all the sins, he also tells them how to be forgiven and cleansed from sin. The how is simply this. It's in the calling upon and confessing to the Lord that the forgiveness for and cleansing come from the Lord. In other words, when sin, re sin remains unconfessed, then sin remains unforgiven and uncleansed, and I'll remain under sin's dominion. So it's important that you uh, confess your sins. So that what I'm about to say to you may be one of the most, if not most powerful, life-freeing and life-giving truths in the entire Bible. Listen up. Here it is. God has made us and wired us from the need for, with the need to confess our sin in order for there to be releasing and freeing from our sin. We don't need to confess to God so he knows. We need to confess to God that we know. When we do, we free ourselves from sin's grip. Let's look at this a little deeper. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from our all righteousness. That's 1 John 1 through 9. Or I'm sorry, 1, 1 John 1, verse 9. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are no longer, since you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6, 14. Please listen closely to what I'm about to say. This is from a one commentator that said this. The longer we hide sin, the longer it goes on condemning us, and we get more and more under its dominion. The sin is one thing, but the superstructure of guilt the devil builds on it is another, and is sometimes far greater than the original sin on which it is built. To understand, then, the true nature of the dominion of sin and what are the devil's intentions, it is, first step, it is the first step into freedom. If at the cross sin lost its power to condemn our substitute, it has also lost its power to condemn the, all those whose substitute, substitute he became. If each one of them now returns to the cross in confession, they may all reckon on this fact, lose their burden of guilt, and step into freedom. Whereas the law demands that we do our utmost, with no result from fur but further condemnation, grace points to Christ as having done all for us, and bids us to reckon ourselves dead with him to the power of our sins, to condemn us to, I'm sorry, let me start to If we, if we take a long time, if we, no, that's not it. 
If each one of us, if each one of them now returns to the cross in confession, they may all reckon in this fact, lose their burden of guilt and step into freedom. Whereas the law demands that we do our utmost with no result but further condemnation, grace points to Christ having done all for us and bids us to reckon ourselves dead with him to the power of our sins and condemn us any longer. If we take a long time to confess, we will be a long time under the dominion of sin. But the moment we humble ourselves to confess it all, we are forgiven, cleansed, and set free from guilt and declared right with God, and all because of the age of binding value in the eyes of God and the blood of Jesus. The foundation of guilt on which Satan built his superstructure is removed by God himself. The superstructure itself comes tumbling down, and the one imprisoned within it is set free. This is the why behind the what that Paul is saying in this. The sharing of his testimony is how he came to Christ. He is now free in Christ. Free from what? Free from the dominion of his past sins. And make no mistake about it, Paul was lacking, was not, wasn't lacking when it came to having past sin. I suggest to you, I, this is uh, something I'd like you to uh, consider. I suggest to you that there are perhaps many in this church today whose hearts are paralyzed and pl plagued by past failures and sins. May I ask you what Ananias asked Paul? Now what are you waiting for? Get up, call on his name, and have your sins washed away. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. The next step is to emphasize God's word. Paul goes on to tell them that when he returned to Jerusalem from Damascus and was praying in the temple, he fell into a trance. He sees and hears the Lord telling him to leave Jerusalem immediately because his testimony about Jesus won't be accepted. Paul is emphasizing the word of the Lord directing and protecting him and not a spiritual experience that would have made it about him. One commentator said it this way, Paul had an impressive vision of Jesus while in the temple. He had never referred to this vision in his letters and seems to only mention it now in necessity. Paul's Christian life was found in God's truth, not spiritual experiences. And he didn't even like to talk about his spiritual experiences. Next step is to communicate God's love. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Paul tries to tell them by referring to his past persecution of Christians that he has some convincing reasons for accepting Christ. He then introduces them to God, God's call in his life to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, even though his heart was, with, was, even though his heart was for the Jews. The problem with this, as we'll see in the next verse, is that this would have been unthinkable. The Jews absolutely hated the Gentiles. What is the Apostle Paul doing here? Make no mistake about it. He knows that mere mention of the world Gentile will anger them. He's communicating God's love for both Jews and Gentiles. Paul knows you can't share your faith without sharing the love of God. And last, expects my position. Up to this word, word they listened to him, then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. The crowd listened to this point, up to this point, up to the point where he mentioned the Gentiles, then they shout, Rid the earth of him, he is not fit to live. I suppose you could say this wasn't very well received. Let me take it a step further. Paul has utterly and miserably failed. Hence, accept opposition or expect some opposition. Rather than being met with success, he's met with vitriolic opposition, and thus he falls into his attempt, fails in his attempt to win his Jewish brothers to Jesus. This reminds me of a time when I, when I spent some time in the financial services industry. In my short career, my number one goal was to help people, to truly help people grow and protect their wealth. You know that, Marvin. However, I can't tell you the number of times I was met with rejection. Very easily, over 95% of the time. So if you can imagine being told no, or I'm not interested 95 times out of 100, 
when you truly know and you're trying to help people and they're always telling you no. It all it took was one client who received my word and acted on it that made it all worthwhile. It meant that someone was getting it and was getting what they needed for their financial wealth. Likewise, sharing the good news with someone through your testimony is very much like being in the financial services industry. You'll meet with much failure, but God wants you to persevere. As Luke says, just so I tell you, there will be no joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So all it takes is that one person who will receive the word and act on it, that will make heaven shout with joy from that someone getting it and getting right with God, all to the eternal benefit of their body, soul, and spirit. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, it's so easy to give up when we're faced with adversity, but please help us remember that that one person who is lost is just as important, if not more so, than the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few, so please make us bold in planting seeds by sharing our testimony and the good news and leaving the watering and harvesting to the Holy Spirit. We ask this in the most precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.